So we wanted a concept that had the same grassroots political power as food sovereignty, but that dealt with the problems of land. Uh, and of course, food sovereignty depends on land to a tremendous degree. But we wanted to go beyond land reform or agrarian reform because we're really talking about territorial control over food sheds, right? And um, the rights of people to the entitlement of the resources that they need for their livelihoods, which of course are land-based and so to a tremendous degree. So that's where we came up with the concept of land sovereignty. Uh, it's a concept which is being discussed broadly within the social movements now. Since I work with transgenic crops, I have to ask you this question. On 11th October, I think you showed the film Bitter Seas with the director, Misha Pillard. And there's a lot of land grabbing going on in India, as well as uh, efforts to um, put industrial agriculture on the agrarian map of India. How do you think these two are connected in India, Africa, and other places? Yes. Well, I mean, clearly, I think you need to have control of territory if you're going to protect your community and your seeds from transgenic crops, from GMOs. And um, yes, regulatory frameworks are important. You know, laws are important. Um, uh, protected markets are important, these types of things. But what we've seen is that um, the seed companies and the chemical companies are perfectly happy to contaminate your seeds, even when all of these safeguards are in place. And then, of course, it's a fait accompli, and you've got GMOs whether you like it or not. So, of course, you need to control territory. And food sovereignty is a concept which allows for you know, the local democratic control over territory in order to resist the enclosures, the genetic enclosures, which come from uh, GMOs. Uh, do you think that peasantry will continue as a group in the future? Because all efforts are being made in different countries to dispossess the peasantry of their seeds and their land, as traditional seeds and their property land. So what's going to happen to them? Well, you know, historically, both uh, capitalism and communism have tried unsuccessfully to rid the world of the peasantry. Um, and one of the reasons they've been unsuccessful is that in both cases they've always depended on the peasantry um, in order to uh, kickstart uh, agricultural industrialization, in order to provide cheap food, in order to provide uh, cheap labor and whatnot. And since uh, industry is always renewing itself, it continues to rely on the peasantry. And since capitalism produces surplus people, they need places for people to go because there's no more room in the cities and the slums and whatnot creates too many uh, social problems. So they need the peasantry on one hand um, to resolve their own contradictions, social and economic contradictions. On the other hand, you know, while we have a process of depeasantization, we also have a process of repeasantization. So we have many peasants now as we have ever had in history. So I, I suspect that we will always have a peasantry, but the question is, what will be the conditions for that peasantry? Will they actually live in uh, conditions in which they can hold the genetic patrimony of the world in vivo? Well, you need healthy agroecosystems for that. I'm not sure. We're not assured that we'll have those. Um, will they be able to reproduce agroecological agro knowledge? Um, you need an entire, a, a thriving peasant culture to do that, not just a family, not just a farmer, not just a village. Um, we don't know. And uh, will the peasantry have water? Will they have schools? Will they have education? Will they have health care? In other words, will the countryside be a decent place to live a dignified life? We don't know. This is what the struggles are about. I don't think. Uh, the struggle is about will we have or will we not have a peasantry. We very likely always will. But the conditions are what the struggle is about. And they are conditions of survival because people are dying 
people are being shot and killed and displaced and whatnot. And so the human rights of the peasantry is what we really have to address. One final question. Have researchers and activists studied whether there's an overlap between transnational corporations that are involved in land deals and transnational corporations involved in food and agriculture, especially transgenic crops? Oh, well, that's a very good question, and I think that's exactly what we're studying now. If you look at uh, um, Food First Research by Tanya Kersen in the Awan Valley of Honduras, what you see is precisely this convergence, right? So we have uh, flex crops, and we have palm oil, and we have genetic uh, engineering, and we have huge land grabs, and we have the involvement of the military and the paramilitary and the police, and we have over 50 um, cooperativists, peasant cooperativists, uh, murdered already simply because they're trying to enforce the land titles which they were given, you know, 20 years ago. Um, so yes, we have we and we have the richest families in Honduras participating in this grab, um, and we have the. Um, the Honduras coup, which provides the political conditions for this grab with the acquiescence of the United States. So you see all the actors come to bear in what results in a very regressive and violent territorial restructuring of the Abogan Valley of Honduras. And what we see is resistance becoming stronger and stronger on the part of the peasantry in the valley. Um, and you know, the question is, how, how will this play out? And I think that researchers and uh, activists have a very important role to play in amplifying the voices of resistance and in demystifying you know, this business of large-scale land acquisitions um, for the violent processes of dispossession that they really are.